Imagine driving across West Texas when suddenly tall buildings come into view, pictured against the skyline, becoming what has come to be referred to as the tall city. This is Midland, our city, our stories. Midland has experienced uncommon or some may say unprecedented growth because of the riches below the ground. Many people think that we are only all industry workers, but we are so much more than that. Our economy is as diverse as our community. The people and their strength and focus on what drives Midland. The sky is the limit for what can be accomplished here. There is no better place to take a risk. Entrepreneurs are not only welcomed, but encouraged and supported. The world's eye is on Midland as the financial and trade center for the vast Permian Basin, which has yielded growth in other areas, restaurants, shopping, parks, medical, live entertainment, the arts, making our wealth even stronger. With growth comes growing pains. Change takes grit and tenacity, much of which this city has. Let's listen. So actually it was through the employment office that the police department in Midland were looking for a bilingual uh, Hispanic because they needed a police officer. They had about 22 police officers and they were all gringos, whites, whatever. And they didn't have any blacks, they have no Mexicans. So that's when they went through the employment office and from here they went down, down the line and in South Texas and I had a friend in the employment office and that we knew each other. He said, they're looking for a police officer that with experience, bilingual. I said, where? He said, in Midland, Texas. I said, where in the hell is Midland? And so he explained to me where Midland was and here I am. There were some struggles, of course, uh, being Hispanic and being disabled. I was very lucky that I could speak both languages. And I speak Espanol just like I speak English. And I speak it at home. And I'm very lucky that I can use it at work. Clients will come in and they don't speak English. So who gets called on sometimes? Me. Uh, in the office that I'm in right now, we have three, four ladies that can actually speak Spanish as well. So I'm no longer the only one. Well, when I came back to Midland, uh, I ended up teaching at an elementary school in Midland, Washington Elementary. And um, Johnny and I, Johnny was at the high school and I was at the elementary school. Uh, the superintendent called me in and asked me if I would like to go to Midland, to Midland High School. And my husband, Johnny, said, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so he, uh, the superintendent, he was very nice. He wanted to know how I felt about going. And so I told him I would like to go. And I was sent to uh, Midland High School. I stayed at Midland High School 19 years. Now remember, this is a school that I could not attend when I was growing up, when I was in high school. We came to Midland because uh, we were looking to find work. And it, we were from East Texas and there were very little work there after the harvest. And it was hard to manage with a family so big. So even though we raised our own crops and we had livestock, it was still hard to survive. And in Midland, we were told there were jobs and an abundance of jobs for people. And so not only did they have a late harvest, there were other jobs. My first experience at, at seeing discrimination against race as opposed to gender 
was when I was probably four or five years old, maybe six, and a African-American couple kept the lawn at the neighbor's house. Uh, and I would go over and talk to them, and they were lovely people. They were just so much fun, and we'd talk about things, and the bugs or whatever was on the ground or whatever it was. And they had a t Model Ford, T and Model T, I think it is, truck. I wanted to ride in that truck so badly, but they, they wouldn't do that. And they said, no, you know, you just can't, we can't give you a ride. I said, well, not, well, we just can't. So I went home to my mother and I said, well, they won't take me on, on a, in that truck. It is so cute. I want to ride in that. And she said, well, they, I, then they won't do it. And I don't know why. My mother must have said something. I don't know. And I said, well, why not? As things move forward in oil and gas, I, I, I spent, oh, maybe three years or so on, on the well service unit. I ended up being uh, all the... Uh, supervisor on that unit and after about three years I moved on to I got transferred to Midland at that time in 1979 I started out in 76 and 79 I got started I was in Midland I, I went to the Spurberry field as a lease operator the very first people that I met when I first came to Midland were Celia and Felipe Morales they um, were the, the chairs of the Mexican dinner. So that's how our friendship began. And from there, it just um, continued. He, uh, Felipe kept asking me, you need to come and look at this one organization that we just started. I know you'll be real interested in it. And I was like, well, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. So in the meantime, I became a Girl Scout leader there for St. Anne's. And then from there, it was Midland Community Theater. I volunteered there as a dresser. And then uh, after that, I thought, well, let me, let me try this group out. And that was the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, I became so involved with it, being treasurer, being the first woman president of the group, to where I eventually became an executive director for the Hispanic Chamber. At that time, husband and wife couldn't teach in the same school system. Not the same school, but in the same school system. So we went up and got married. <laughs> <laughs> in April, just before the end of the school year. We met in September, and we married in April before the school year ended. So we were told that we both couldn't teach there. The e one of us had to leave. So it was decided that I was going to be the one to leave. <laughs> Uh, yes, there were other uh, African Americans employed in the in the laboratory. Uh, one I remember, Anne Annie Laura Johnson. She had already been here and worked in chemistry. And when I started working, I was in hematology. There were different sections of the laboratory, but there were one other laboratory medical technologist in the hospital. The black doctors in Midland when I started here in 1965 was Dr. Viola Coleman and uh, Dr. Cooper, and I can't remember his, his first name. So there were two black doctors here. My husband was working at Tom's Pharmacy um, on North Lee Street to, in fact, it was the address was 204 North Lee. He was hired by John and Helene Crawford, who owned the pharmacy, and that's where he worked, and he had started in November of 1963. In July 1968, uh, the Crawfords wanted to sell, and uh, my husband wanted to purchase the pharmacy, so um, that's what we did, and it was official before the end of July of 1968. My father was a self-taught entrepreneur. In Clarksville, he had many jobs. He owned a candy shop at one time, a small candy shop. Uh, he worked as an ice man 
from time to time. He also worked at a pharmacy where even at times he was able to fill prescriptions uh, if there was somebody on, on lunch. Uh, my dad also purchased books and learned how to build and to fix radios. And right before we came to Midland, the television was born. And he also taught himself to fix televisions. And he set up his first business called Pete's Fix-It Shop. When we arrived, my father took a job as a janitor. And he worked at the petroleum building and he worked at some other buildings. He also did yards and other odd jobs. So he had about three jobs at all times. That entrepreneur story kind of really expands. So mom and dad built that restaurant. Part of the restaurant was, the, the main restaurant was the restaurant, and then a part of it was their office, their insurance office, in the same building. So they would literally close that door, lock it, and just walk yeah. over here, and here's the restaurant, and open the restaurant. Then at two o'clock, close that restaurant, and go back and open up the insurance mm -hmm. business. So That's right. they were working hand in hand in the same building for a little while, and then they built their uh, insurance office on the same property, on the same parking lot. The, uh, the Black Advisory approached my mom and asked her, would she start a senior center? And this was in 1986, and she did, and it was started at Hollowell United Methodist Church. So they met at Hollowell United Methodist Church uh, starting in 1986 uh, until uh, 1991, which at that time, she and the uh, community and the men and women of that group, which they would call the Golden Guilders at that time, uh, they um, got together and uh, they fought for a place where they could come together because they were outgrowing Hollowell, uh, United Methodist Church. And so um, that, uh, that's when she went to the city council, her and the, the community people and her group, their, um, the Golden Guilders <laughs> and all, um, went to the city council and asked uh, for a building. And... Um, a lot of uh, everything went home, but finally they did get a building, and that's what is now called the Southeast Senior Center uh, here in Midland. But that was the building, and it was built in um, March of 1991. They entered the building in March of 1991. I became the center director, um, and becoming the center director, it was an honor and a privilege to carry on. Uh, the uh, programs and the things that she had started and I looked back um, as to what uh, she and the other persons there, the personnel had accomplished and all and being able to uh, continue that and be a, a service to the community still uh, was an honor and, and even uh, now to this day people will come in and say well I knew your mom and uh, she helped get us this or she helped get us food or she did this for us and you know so it was an honor to to be able to continue in that role to uh, provide services uh, for people um, that uh, come in need or um, just needing a bit of direction or, or just finding out information and also it, it has been an honor to carry on that uh, what she did. Well, it began in 1995, and it was just from a group of individuals or a group of moms that wanted to preserve the culture of matachines, which is a different type of dancing, um, and, it, and it's different all over because it's different in New Mexico than what it is here in, in Texas. But they taught the children that, and they performed, and from that performance, came the, the love and, and the idea of creating an organization that could continue that part. So they did, they went ahead and formed the Hispanic Cultural Center and from there, our responsibility has been to go ahead and um, bring back the dance and the dance that we do is if through Mexico is very traditional. So it's uh, something that the, the teacher itself will go ahead and not only teach the dance, not only teach what they're wearing or show what they're wearing and describe the costume, why they do the costume, but sometimes there's the faith part that you have to go ahead and explain as to why 
it was done this way and what was the meaning of each step. And you'd be surprised that the way you move your hands, the way you move your skirt, the way you move your feet, all is in, in conjunction with the actual history of the actual dance. When we started work on the trees, we realized that, you know, that, that's something special for them. That's, a, that's unique and different. So that's the idea we came up with, coming up with the trees and having the students decorate the trees. Um, the other thing was having them create their own altars. And these, the parents loved this part because they were able to go ahead and show the students the food, the different kinds of flowers that are used, the different kind of breads that they're used for the altars, which no one really, really, really understood or, or realized that there were several, several t uh, special things and items you can put on that altar, that it's not just items that you think you want to go ahead and put on there. So it had to have meaning, it had to have cause. So when we, we realized that, yeah, we, we hit something here, we realized that this is something the students really love, we decided to continue keeping it. I had gone to Austin to attend a convention of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And so they came back with these ideas and then they got a group going here. And actually Felipe was one of the original uh, members that attended that meeting. And so I came on a little bit later. And so, yes, they were very instrumental. Not only Felipe, but several other uh, Hispanic uh, business people in Midland. And I think what we began to identify at that time was that uh, the minorities, Hispanics and African Americans, were now becoming business owners or becoming very active in the business community and saw a need for a chamber of commerce that would help um, the minority business owners or operators. And, and so with that, that Hispanic Chamber of Commerce really took off serving the community problem. Even though it was well, it was meant for the whole community, you saw it serving a lot of the east side community. And uh, it was very, again, engaging to see all of these uh, young entrepreneurs, because they were really young, uh, uh, starting the Hispanic Chamber, coming to fruition again. Mm, yes. So after moving back, I was always interested in gardening. And before I moved back, my brother had talked me into buying this uh, two and a half acres that was near him. He had two and a half acres. And it, the other two and a half was up for sale. And he asked me and my husband, say, why don't you all buy the, the land? I would like for a family to be close to me. And we bought that two and a half acres while we were still in Chicago. So after coming back, you know, we'd go out there and look at it. And finally, we decided that we would start a garden. It took a lot of work, and my brother would plow the land up, and uh, we would invite family to come out and help. And after doing that a couple of years, uh, we decided to build a house out there because, uh, you know, we would just be out there for hours, and we didn't have any, as they say, facilities out there. And so uh, we built the garden house, and... Uh, we made it a place that family could come and uh, celebrate holidays, birthdays, and also come and garden. And uh, we have family coming on uh, Good Friday. We have family coming from Waco, Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas, uh, Lubbock, Abilene. They come and help us plant. And uh, then in uh, October, the weekend before Halloween, they come back for harvest. And so everybody helps uh, dig and sweet potatoes, uh, picking peas, greens, digging carrots, and they take whatever they want. And whatever is left, we usually uh, give it to people in the community. So when I went over to interview, then uh, they said, well, you have to have license to sell. But what we're going to do is we'll work with you until you get it. So we'll hire you as a secretary and we'll pay you weekly. And when you uh, study and take the test, when you pass it, well, then you can sell real estate. 
and uh, I studied for the test. I, I took it. Uh, the first time, I missed a few questions in math. And I thought, well, you know, how long do I have to wait to take it again? And they said, uh, you don't have to wait very long. I think it was two or three months. So I went back over to Carver, and I told Mr. Taylor, I said, I need a math tutor because there are some things that I missed on the test, and I need to study for that. So there was a, a Mr. Nesby was there, and he said, well, let me talk with Mr. Nesby. So Mr. Nesby had me come to Carver after hours, uh, and we went over all of the math. And then my memory came back, because I'd been out of school maybe a couple of years. And uh, when I took the test again, I don't think I missed anything on that test. I passed it in flying colors. And I became the first African-American female to sell real estate in, in Midland, Texas, as a saleswoman. I would like to share a story about my, uh, one of my grandsons. Uh, I got, uh, what, I got four grandsons. I think that's right, four grandsons and uh, two granddaughters. And I love them to death, they they my heart. And uh, one day, uh, Braylon, one of my grandsons, called me and said, Granddaddy, I need to make some money. I said, really? And he said, yeah, I need to make some money. I, what can I do? Can I rake the yard? Can I do this or that? And I thought at that time, I said, you know, I spent a lot of years, uh, 46 years in labor, working with my hands and stuff like that. And I thought about my parents and my grandparents. And I said, well, I said, Braylon, I, I want you to do something. I want you to write an essay about your classes in elementary school. What your, your teachers, what your classes are about and just give us a little insight into each class and what are you doing and so forth. He said, is that all? I said, yes, that's what I want you. And I said, I want the spelling to be right. I said, I want everything to be, paragraphs got to be right. I said, uh, not just a little short one page deal. He said, okay, granddaddy. So he goes and writes that and he, and, and then when he brings it back to me, I said, Braylon, now what I'm trying to show you that you can make money with your brain not only with your hands. And I think that has to be passed on. And I think it, it forced him to think about things, you know, in a different way. We often, when, we, when I was raised, I was raised, uh, you know, my dad was a World War II veteran, uh, Big Red One in the European campaign against Germany. But he come off a farm, farm boy, you know, they learned to work with their hands, right? And he passed that on to me, you know, get out there and get a job, work hard and everything, you know. And uh, some of y'all be teachers and stuff like that one day, you know. But I wanted to pass on to Braylon. Braylon is a very brilliant kid. I wanted to pass on to him that, Braylon, you can make money with thinking also. I said, you have to be to get in that category. You got to get in that area also. So uh, I think he learned a lesson from that that money and, and wealth is earned in different areas in different ways. It's not just running up and down the field. It's not just uh, doing physical labor, even though all that's very important. We need every part of that in our economy, right? But I tried to teach him that that was important, to think and you can make money also. Yes, actually my disability has been a big benefit at work. Um, you know, I work with senior volunteers and my job is to recruit them, place them in different locations here in the Midland. The program I uh, operate is called the Retired and Senior Volunteer Program. And it's in short RSVP. They will say, you know what? You're in a chair. I said, yes, I am. And you're, you're asking me to help how can I turn you down? And I'm like, not just because I'm in, you know, because you are doing a lot of work for the community despite being disabled. Well, I, didn't, I said, yes, it doesn't affect my mind. It doesn't affect my spirit. It may slow me down in here and there, but 
it, it doesn't dampen anything that I can do. So it has brought, brought in a little positive outlook to the work that I do. And um, actually, it was somewhat because of my disability that I got this position. Uh, you know, it's never easy. Uh, there's a lot of hardship along the way. Uh, there's a lot of times that you cry and cry hard. Um, but, if you, you know, we have a, a drive that we're just going to keep working hard. We're going to keep uh, rely, leaning on each other's shoulders. And I hope that, um, you know, I hear a lot of my friends or a lot of people around the community say, your dad was amazing, he had a great smile, he was a hard worker. Your mom always supported him and backed him. It was great to see you kids always there with them. And I hope that legacy can carry on with other families, uh, newer generations coming up saying, uh, we really uh, envy the Morales family, you know, sticking together and having those businesses on, on the corner of Neely and Big Spring Street, having a record shop, a barber shop, a restaurant, a law office, an insurance office. It was amazing to see y'all grow and working together and setting the example for our community. Uh, not only did y'all take care of your business, but you served nonprofits and then you led in the community. And so I hope that, uh, that we can inspire other families, uh, newer generations coming up, to, to do the same because we, we will become, uh, we will move on as others have, and it takes that spirit to continue flowing so that we can keep Midland, Texas, as you say, Midland America strong for many generations to come. The legacy I would prefer to leave with my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren, hopefully, that our family contribute to, to the society in this country in a positive way. We gave back what we could. Anything that we gave back, we hope it helps someone to continue. We always want to push people up, not pull them down. And so that, that legacy for my grandchildren, I want them to know that this is what drives my family one thing each person has in common is they didn't give up. Midland is no stranger to feast or famine. The economy here relies heavily on the natural resources of oil and gas. There's a saying, boom to bust, to boom again. But with that, you need the Mavericks, the unsung heroes driving innovation. They are the risk takers that are invested in this community. You have an idea, you take a chance and you go for it. Perhaps you were drawn to Midland like many of our historians for work and there was just something about this community that caused you to put down roots here and call it home. Well, that too is part of our stories. We'd love to hear from you and know about your story. I'm Michael Williams. Thank you for joining us as we will continue this important conversation on diversity. Midland, our city, our stories, good night. The best thing that I've done in Midland, America, as uh, Ms. Rosemary says it, is Juneteenth. Juneteenth is the pinnacle of what Midland really is. It's, it's a fun time, right? But behind that fun, it's also an organization and people coming together on one accord and pushing out the best possible event for everyone to enjoy. And really, Juneteenth is, symbol is a, it symbolizes what how effective and how efficient we are together when we're all thinking together and we all have that one goal. So if we use that same energy, it's like we do with Juneteenth for fun, if we put it in other aspects of our community, not only will we be excelling the youth, we'll be excelling each other. <laughs>